If we could pray and ask you to bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we just ask that your Holy Spirit be in this place and uh, that they would see more of you and less of me, Lord, that the scripture that uh, we're looking at today in Romans that uh, would be brought out to where we can apply it to our lives today, Lord. I just ask for each one here today, for your blessing on them, Lord, and uh, for anyone listening on YouTube, Lord, we also ask that you would just uh, be with them as they listen, and uh, if this is something new to them, we just ask that they would um, seek out a good Bible-believing church, Lord, uh, that uh, preaches your word, Lord, and we ask your blessing on this whole day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. My sermon today is called Being Secure in the Love of God. We're going to be looking in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. If you turn there, I'm going to read. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we... How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we have death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be to be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a powerful passage and there's a lot in here. What I'm going to preach today is only a portion of what we could actually go on for a whole series of. There's a lot to glean from this passage. Um, if you look in verse 31, it talks about in response to. What he's talking about there is everything that has been spoke about in the uh, previous passages of chapters 1 through 8. But if you look in verses 28 through 30, he impresses on us the encouragement. He talks about um, the works of God. He talks about what God has done for us. And he talks about how his son came here to earth for us. Talking about in response to us. Now the background of this passage, if you think about um, the Roman times at that time, uh, Rome was um, a very, very big city at this time. Uh, almost a million people is what they, uh, the, the scholars figure. Uh, the inception of the small village that it was on the river of Tiber, it was founded in 753 B.C., um, the book itself of Romans was actually written in 57 AD. And interestingly enough, I did not realize until I was studying this passage that um, Paul did not start the, the Church of Rome, but the interesting part is his heart showed no compromise to, even though he didn't start this, the Holy Spirit just worked through him, which was very interesting. And at this time, this was his third missionary journey. Uh, it, 
you can find that and uh, jot down Acts 20 verse 3 because that's a key passage when it's talking about Paul and his third missionary journey, which he is in Corneth when he writes this, this book. And there's actually a plot to kill Paul at this moment in time, which makes me even more profound about how he preaches the gospel in spite of being under this persecution and this somebody plotting to kill him. I just, it just kind of blows me away to look at that and say, wow, here a man is not worried about what's going to happen to his life because he's preaching the word of God. How much more should I in a country that we live in have the opportunity on a daily basis to be around people and be able to share the gospel of Christ. God's really put that as a conviction on my heart um, lately. And he's really shown me a lot. But personally, that's what I was gleaming from, from that passage. I just thought that that was really interesting. How he is being uh, plotted after and being sought after. Also, if you look in these, um, this passage here. If you go down through it, we have all the questions are answered that we look at when we were a child, that we were taught in class. Who, what, when, where, and why um, in, in this passage. And I thought that was very interesting how Paul answers any single question. So, so there's no question that God is for us and who can be against us. He answers every single one of them questions with this passage. Also, if we look in um, Revelation 1.8, he talks about, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. <coughs> Even time can't separate us from the love of Christ once we come to know him. That's the neat part. Time can't separate us Height can't separate us. We can go to the highest mountain that God has put on this earth. Won't separate us. We can go to the ends of the earth. We can go to the depths of the deepest sea. And we will not be separated from the love of God. In verse 33, the New King James Version says, Who shall, be, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? In the Greek, elect means ekleistos, which stands for select or favorite or chosen. It is the same in 1 Peter 1 verse 2. He is speaking to the Christians. If you look at 1 Peter 2 verse 6, the elect will not be confounded. Confound in that passage also means to put to shame or dishonor. William Newell describes election not of works, but on the contrary, of him that calleth, in Romans 9 verse 11, as absolutely as righteousness is not of works, so neither is election. Both have God himself as the source, with the S being capitalized. So the purpose of God according to the election stands. Verse 34. The New King James Version reads, And furthermore is also risen. Verse 36 speaks of Paul quoting from Psalms 44 verse 22. I know it, it kind of looks odd set in this passage. But Paul, what Paul is referring to is back when they used to have animal sacrifices. Uh, that is what the passage is talking about, being, lamb, being taken as lambs to the slaughter. Douglas Moe says, God has transformed us from the realm of Adam, sin, and death into the realm of Christ, righteousness, and life. 
So to be secure in the love of God means four things of what I got out of this passage. These four, you can take these four and uh, look even more in depth, but uh, being secure in the love of God means, number one, it means no one can defeat us. Verse 31 says, in response to this, Paul is, is talking about uh, earlier in the passages we spoke about. Uh, earlier in this particular passage, verses 28 through 30, but also the whole previous part of Romans, verses, or chapters 1 through 8. He also foreknew us, which means he knew before the beginning of the earth that we were going to come into being, and because he created us. The creator knows everything. And that's, an, that's even more awesome to realize. I'm going to read chapter, er, verses 28 through 30 so you can see a little bit of uh, what I'm speaking of. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, which we spoke about, he also predestined to be conformed, as we spoke about conformed, to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. He's emphasizing each one of those things because he doesn't say it just once, but he says it twice in there. Each one of those things that God did, he states twice. That to me is saying there's an emphasis on this part. This is very critical when looking at that passage. I remember when I was in basic training, as any of you know that have been in the military before, the drill sergeants wear these big hats they call the brown round. You've probably seen them in movies if you haven't been in the military. And they stick way out and they're kind of like they got these huge brims. Well, I'll never forget when I was in my basic training stage and one of my drill sergeants, we just had gotten back from Christmas vacation because I went at the end of November and uh, we had Christmas break in between, which is something that doesn't normally happen. Uh, I just happened to be there at the right time, so I got to go home. And once I got back, I realized I had not brought my dog tags. So what I did was, we were in physical training that next morning, waiting in line, and we had an inspection for what else but uh, my dog tags. Well, my drill sergeant came up to me, and he seen that my, my dog tags were not out. He got right in my face. In fact, he got so close to my face that the brim of his hat touched the brim of my head. And he said, Private Haynes, where are your dog tags? And I told him, I said, Drill sergeant, my dog tags are back in New York State. I forgot them. Well, I want you to know that day, that drill sergeant encouraged me to always wear my dog tags, and I never forgot them since. Earlier in the book of Romans, Paul talks about encouragement, uh, living in the Spirit, and also he talks about being dead in Christ, which is in chapter 6 and chapter 8. My second point is, being secure in the love of God not only means that no one can defeat us, but it also means that he spared no cost for us. E.P. Sanders contends that the Jews of Paul's time did not view works as a means of salvation, but as a means of maintaining status in the covenant relationship with God. He names his view covenantal nominus, and he insists that first century Jews felt their, their election by God as his covenant people was a source of their salvation. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. The song goes, Amazing Grace, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? 
He did not deserve what God gave us. We didn't deserve what God gave us. That's what we call grace. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. There was a missionary. He was a missionary and he had been witnessing to this one fellow who was a professional scuba diver. The scuba diver one day ended up coming up to him and handing him a pearl and saying, here, this is for you. The missionary, seeing how unflawed this pearl was and how beautiful and big it was, said, well, I can't take this. What would you like for it? I can pay you for it. The young man says, no, you can't pay me for it. I, I, I won't accept anything for it. The missionary still wanting to make sure that he paid for this thing, being it would look so expensive, he says, please, he said, this has got to be expensive. I must pay you something for it. What will you accept? Once again, the friend refused. He said, no, he said, I can't accept anything for it. He says, you see, he said, this pearl came from my son the last time that he was diving when they pulled his body from the water. It was that day that that young man learned what salvation was by his own son's actions and what had happened to him. He learned the free gift of salvation is something that is only given and it's free that you can't pay for it. That day that young man accepted Christ as his Savior. So not only being secured in the love of God means no one can defeat us, it also means he spared no cost to love us, and it also means that no one can condemn us. He died for us, he was the only righteous man that could, that could live on this earth and die for us and shed his blood, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. He proves that one can bring change against a saved person for their sin in God, and he chose to forgive us and not condemn us. This is where things happen. This is where Satan loses, folks. Satan is the loser in all the battle, and he lost that day when Jesus rose from the dead. Number four, being secured in the love of God means no one can separate us from the love of God. Justification, as it is referred to in this passage, is dealing with salvation. If you look in verse 39, it says, The main hinge on which religion turns, an error in justification is dangerous, like a defect in a foundation. John Calvin. Imagine the foundation of the Empire State Building being built out of paper mache. It's not possible and it wouldn't withstand anything. That's like us, building our foundation on something that isn't stable. We can build our foundation on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our firm foundation. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Martin Luther King wrote, When the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen, he declared. This is the chief article from which other doctrines have flowed. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, perceives, and defends the church of God, and without it the church of God can only, cannot exist for one hour. God not only proved all this, but he proved he stands the test of time. Time cannot separate us from the love of God. Psalms 96, 95, 1 through 6. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In, in his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountains, peaks belong to him. 
The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. A man in England wrote his will on an empty eggshell. It read, To Meg, everything I possess, J.B. It was probated. Wills have been written on leather, old pictures, shells, clothes, glass, and furniture. One man had his will tattooed on his back. The important thing is that the will be written and duly witnessed. So is God's word written on your heart? Let us pray. Our most loving and heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now and we thank you for this message you give us of encouragement, security, and your love that can have no end and no boundaries, Lord. It fought through sin, it fought through Satan, it fought through the depths of hell, and still resounded, Lord. And it's still there today, Lord. You accept us for who we are once we come to know you, and you don't allow sin to separate us from you, because your Son sent his blood to die for us so that we could come to you. I just ask now for each one here, I ask for the listening audience on YouTube that each one that's heard this message today will be able to take this message and use it for you, Lord. If they have any questions, I ask that they comment to me, make comments to me, and also that they find a local church, a good Bible-believing church, Lord, that they could come to, and if they're in Auburn, maybe they'll come to Auburn Alliance, Lord. We would love to see them here. And we just thank you for all you do, Lord, and we lift each one of these folks up to you. In your precious name we pray, amen.